Thank you very much, Saburi San. It's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to try to present um, this work. So I'm going to be looking at the East Asian electronics sector and just a little bit about how learning and development took place within this sector. And then based on that, try to think of some lessons for countries like the United States. The United States is very eager to strengthen its semiconductor manufacturing. And Asia has been so very successful. So I'm trying to see other lessons for countries like the United States from the successes we've seen um, in, in Asia. So East Asia has become totally the center of electronics manufacturing. So the manufacturing of, of phones, computers, semiconductors, um, huge amounts are made in Asia, um, much more than the rest of the world. And when 90% of advanced semiconductors are made in Taiwan, their risk if there are wars, natural disasters, blockades, or other events which would disrupt the flow of chips from Taiwan. So the U.S. and other countries are seeking to reshore semiconductor manufacturing. So are there lessons from East Asia's success? Um, and so the presentation will consist of six parts. So the first part is um, trying to present a framework for understanding how learning and technological advancement took place in East Asia. Um, so just a kind of a theoretical background about how did this amazing learning happen in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea, in other Asian countries. Then I want to very briefly talk about Japan's experience, draw some lessons. So Japan's experience after World War II when we had the electronics sector, Sony, Samsung, uh, Sony, Sharp, other companies just taking off. And then look at Taiwan and South Korea's experience, where again, they had absolutely very, very little background in electronics, and they quickly came to the frontier. Then think about ASEAN's experience, China's experience, and then try to draw um, some lessons for the United States. Um, so one of the things, when we think about how learning and technological advancement took place in East Asia, um, one of the uh, um, items that scholars have highlighted is that the initial conditions before the industrial takeoff were actually fairly um, beneficial. So there was high savings rates in Asia. There was prudent fiscal policy, low inf inflation. The workforce was relatively educated compared to the rest of the world. There were flexible labor markets. So there was very beneficial initial conditions which uh, helped the initial takeoff of um, learning, uh, technological assimilation, and um, um, technological progress in Asia. So within this context, one of, the, um, uh, one of the factors that scholars have highlighted, so Professor Okawa and other scholars, is that um, when workers, their technical competence affects their ability to absorb new technologies. So the more educated the workforce is, the better they are at adopting new technologies, even simple labor-intensive technologies. If the workforce has a basic education, they're better able to learn those technologies, master them, apply them. So the, the quality of the workforce matters a lot for the ability to absorb technologies, to learn new technologies. Um, also, exporting and importing, so having an open economy is, can be very beneficial for technological advances. So when firms are facing competition, they have to choose technology very carefully. So if you're exporting in very competitive uh, consumer markets, you have to be very careful to choose technology which is actually going to be competitive. So you don't want to spend too much on technology. Technology is very expensive, but you also don't want to forego necessary technology. So the discipline of competition forces firms to, or necessitates firms to make good choices concerning technology. Um, uh, this is a, also true with importing. So if you, have, if you have competition from imports coming into your country, it forces your firms to be more competitive and to be more technologically savvy. Um, the second thing about exporting and open markets is it provides vast markets. So say Japan after World War II could export to the whole world market which was a, a huge market. And so this led to the benefits of learning by doing. So when you're producing millions and millions of items, at first you're inefficient, at first um, there's a lot of mistakes, but the more you produce, the more capable you become. So exporting and world markets led to this very beneficial learning by, by doing um, in Asian economies. 
And people uh, have sometimes, scholars have sometimes broken up uh, this technological learning into several stages. So the, the first stage is basically when firms have uh, very little experience with technology. So at this point, they need to um, import technologies, and technologies are expensive, so they need to choose very carefully which uh, technologies to import. Um, and public research institutes can often help them to choose the appropriate technologies, can help them to link up with foreign firms which have the technologies. So in the first stage, you're basically importing technologies which are often mature technologies, very basic technologies, and then your workers are learning how to use them. So workers at this point do a lot of basic research, so not advanced scientific research, but say taking apart machinery, putting it back together, trying to understand how very basic technology works. So this is the first stage which, which Asia went through. Um, at the second stage, you become more comfortable with the technology and you're seeking to get more mileage out of it. So you're seeking to go out into world markets and compete using the technology. At the third stage, you're basically approaching the technological frontier. So at this point, you become a very active competitor with the companies which had given you um, the technology. And so this, at this uh, stage, the, the whole nature of the game has changed. And so what, what scholars have highlighted is in this whole process of learning and technological assimilation, entrepreneurs play a crucial role. So entrepreneurs will possess vision, um, they'll take intelligent risks with no guarantees of return, they provide jobs for the educated workers, so entrepreneurs seem to just play a very vital role in this technological advancement. Um, also within, um, Within Asia, what we've seen is that value chains have become very, very intricate. So multinational corporations lower costs by slicing production into fragmented blocks based on wage levels, factor endowments, physical and human infrastructure, and other factor. So, so they might put the assembly operations in places where wages are lower. They might put the research and development in places where uh, uh, workers are well educated, so they break up um, the production into to several different fragmented blocks, um, and they make the decision to fragment production, at least in theory, when the cost saving from fragmenting exceeds the service link cost of, uh, of linking separated production blocks. So if by moving production, say, from Japan to um, Thailand, the, the, the savings in terms of lower wages are, are high enough to offset the cost of, of having to go across uh, national borders, the cost of having to deal with different legal systems. So whenever the savings are greater than the service cost of linking production blocks, firms have an incentive to do this. And so then the cost of linking production uh, blocks across um, different regions reflect the cost of imperfect information, unstable contracts, uncredible partners, cost due to transportation, telecommunication, and interfirm coordination. Um, corruption tends to increase the service link costs. So if you're dealing with a country where there's a lot of corruption, it's much more costly to establish production blocks there. On the other hand, if there's high quality infrastructure, highways, ports, airports, and other infrastructure, this reduces the cost. So firms then have an incentive to relocate production when the savings from relocating production, say to lower wage areas, are higher than um, the costs which arise from all the difficulties of producing across national boundaries. Um, <clears throat> we can think of foreign direct investment, which has played a very large role in Asia in the electronics industry. There's different models of foreign direct investment. So one model was by uh, Robert Mundell, and what he posited was that capital inflows would cause the capital-intensive industry to expand in the, um, the country receiving the FDI. So for instance, in his framework, if you think of Japan investing in Indonesia, this would say Japan would invest in the very high-tech sectors in Indonesia, so say robotics, um, um, quantum computing. So the capital flows will go to the very advanced industries um, in the country they're investing in. Professor Kojima, on the other hand, said that capital flows would um, go to the labor-intensive industries. So if Japan were investing in Indonesia, it would invest in um, 
say textiles, footwear, um, assembly operations. So it would try to strengthen if, um, if in Japan um, labor has gotten more expensive, then it would invest, say, in, an, in another country where labor is cheaper and try to um, uh, move production there. And so Kojima is, is in his framework, FDI is, is a means um, of transmitting capital, managerial skill, technical knowledge. So when you invest, say, if a Japanese corporation invests in ASEAN, it, it will not only build a factory, but it also impart knowledge. It'll help um, the, the factory to get started. It'll uh, give managerial skills. It'll transmit a whole bundle of, um, of beneficial production techniques to the importing country. Um, <clears throat> when we think of uh, electronics production in Asia, what we see is that, say, semiconductors might come from uh, South Korea and Taiwan, image sensors might come from Japan, other parts might come from multinational corporations in ASEAN, they might go to China for assembly, for construction, and then for re-export. So when so much of the value added comes from Asian countries um, other than, say, China, that suggests that exchange rates throughout Asia are going to matter for exports. So when the yen is weak as it is now, then the dollar cost of image sensors is going to be less, and so all the products containing image sensors are going to be more competitive. When the uh, South Korean won is weak as it is now, semiconductors are going to be cheaper in dollars. So in, in this case, um, all the products containing semiconductors for export are going to be cheaper. So this suggests that, say, when China's exporting uh, uh, phones or computers, it's not just the renminbi exchange rate which matters, but it's exchange rates throughout the Asian supply chain, throughout all the countries providing value added. Um, <clears throat> scholars have also highlighted the China shock. Um, and so what we saw is that U.S. imbalances with East Asia uh, soared after China's uh, 2001 uh, joining of the World Trade Organization. And so at this point, China liberalized trade. The Stolper-Samuelson theorem implies that trade liberalization will benefit capital in the United States and harm labor. So trade liberalization will be beneficial for countries like Apple and be very harmful for uh, U.S. manufacturing workers. And what scholars have found is that the amount of harm that came to manufacturing workers was much more than, than people anticipated. So Otur and his co-authors found that job losses in the United States following China's WTO ascension occurred in sectors exposed to competition from China. Asimoglu and his colleagues reported that China's imports caused stunning losses in U.S. manufacturing jobs. Pearson and Schott reported that U.S. counties exposed to imports from China experienced many, many deaths of despair. So deaths from drug addiction, suicide, other very harmful things. Um, so the China's WTO ascension was very, very good for China's exports, but it was very, very hard on U.S. workers. And so because of this, I think this was one of the main reasons why protectionism became so strong in recent years in the United States. So let me start talking a little bit about Japan's experience. I want to talk about a few um, uh, companies which, have been which were very, very successful in electronics exporting. Um, so the, the first um, company I want to talk about, actually I want to talk about Tadashi Sasaki, who was um, uh, the, the head of um, Hayakawa, which later, later was renamed Sharp. Um, and he was an amazing entrepreneur. So he happened to be in the United States when Bell Labs actually invented the transistors. He immediately realized what an incredible uh, advance this was. Um, and he immediately started talking to people at Bell Labs. Um, and uh, Sasaki was a very, very well-educated, very, very intelligent man. So he studied at Kyoto, at Dresden University in Germany. He'd worked, done research with a, a famous Stanford professor, Stangenberg. Um, and he had very, very many ideas. He constantly had new ideas. Um, and Japan at this time was not able, was not allowed to join the, say, defense contracting. So in the United States, there's very, very lucrative defense contracts for electronics. But Japan at this point was restricted to consumer products, which was a very, very competitive market. So Sasaki was 
constantly coming up with new ideas about what kind of consumer products could his firm produce. Um, and so at one point, he, he became convinced that if you added more and more transistors to an integrated circuit, you could produce a, a calculator which a housewife could hold in her hand. <clears throat> and his engineers were very doubtful about this. They thought this was impossible. But he, he kept pushing them. He sent three of them to Kyoto University to study uh, the technology. Um, then he went throughout the, the world trying to find somebody who could make um, computer chips. Finally, he convinced an American company called Autonetics to make chips for calculators. And at the, at the time, most US companies were making chips for the military, which was very, very lucrative. And he had to work very hard to convince them to make chips for this um, uh, uh, very demanding, um, unremunerative consumer market. But they agreed to do this. Um, and, and, and finally, they, they managed to succeed. By 1970, uh, Sharp had introduced a battery-powered calculator that weighed less than a kilo. Um, and, and this was a very, very popular item. They sold millions and millions of these calculators. Um, and then Sasaki asked RCA, an American company, to make LCD panels for calculators. Um, but RCA didn't want to. Instead, they licensed the technology to Sharp. Sharp kept working on it until they learned how to make it. RCA helped them to master the technology. Um, Sasaki at one point said that if Sharp had not learned how to make these LCD panels themselves, it might not have been a successful business. But they learned how to make them, and then they used those to make uh, award-winning 14-inch thin screen TVs. So Sasaki and, and Sharp continued to innovate, continued to choose technologies, and were able to succeed in these very, very demanding consumer markets. So another famous company which succeeded was, was Sony. Um, and in 1953, the uh, CEO of Sony, Akio Morita, signed an agreement with Western Electric to make trans transistors. So Western Electric licensed the technology. Sony worked very hard to learn how to make this. So Sony researchers visited US factories and laboratories. And the US researchers were very generous at sharing the knowledge. At the same time, Sony researchers studied the book Transistor Technology, which was put out by Bell Labs. So they worked very hard to master this technology. They faced all kinds of problems as they were trying to make transistor radios. Um, some were very, very complicated physics problems that um, uh, so one researcher at Sony actually solved a very complicated physics problem using quantum physics and won the Nobel Prize for this. So Sony faced very, very difficult technological problems, but they managed to uh, master the technology. Um, and in 1955, they made very small transistor radios, pocket-sized, transi 1957, they made pocket-sized transistor radios, which were very, very popular and sold uh, 7 million um, units in the United States. So, so Sony then was able to master this technology to make very, very popular uh, consumer items. Um, then in 1968, Sony made the Trinitron TV, which was a color TV. Consumers loved this. And Sony had patents on this, which perfect, protected it from the very, very difficult price competition in consumer markets. In 1973, the Sony vice president pushed engineers to study uh, charge coupled devices. Um, the Bell, research, Bell Lab researchers freely shared this technology with Sony. Um, Sony engineers said at the time they were free to play around with this technology to try to make it work. Eventually, they made camcorders, which were very, very profitable. And then the Sony co-founders, Morita and Ibuka, goaded engineers to make the Sony Walkman. In 1979, they made the Walkman, which, which sold uh, 400 million units. So this was a case also where Sony was competing in very, very difficult consumer markets, very cutthroat competitive markets. So they used technology to gain the upper hand and to produce uh, um, successful products, profitable products. Um, so also Japan um, uh, became a, a large player in semiconductors. Let me skip this. I don't want to take too much time on this. Um, but how, what was Japan's educational, macroeconomic, and trade policy backdrop during this, this, this kind of electronics miracle, this time when electro, the electronics industry just um, took off? So what we see is um, in 1950, the average schooling years, Professor Hayami has 
research this, the average schooling years of working age population in Japan was 70% of the frontier country. Uh, by 1970, this increased to 80%. In 1940, 5,000 engineers would graduate per year in Japan. This just jumped steadily to 50,000 in 1970. And until 1975, Professor Sawa highlighted that engineers got both a technical and a very broad liberal arts training. So they learned literature, philosophy, history. And Steve Jobs has famously commented that when you combine technical training with liberal arts training, it produces results that makes the heart sing. It produces these very, um, very, very interesting products which consumers love. So Japan had invested very heavily in education, which clearly helped in, in adopting these new technologies. Japanese consumers, ha having experienced a lot of poverty, saved a large share of their income after World War II. So there's a large share of savings enabling, uh, available to fund investment. So electronics, semiconductors require very heavy investment, and there was a lot of savings in Japan to, to provide funds for those investments. So the, the trading environment in Japan's largest market, the U.S., was tilted towards free trade until um, the 1980s. So there was um, very much of a free trade environment. <coughs> um, entrepreneurs such as Tadashi Sasaki guided companies that take intelligent risks. Uh, the U.S. freely shared discoveries, technology with their Japanese uh, um, uh, counterparts. Um, and Japanese workers were very well educated, very hard working, which helped them to assimilate technologies. Um, firms tended to channel the, um, the, the money which came to them, their profits into R&D. They gave engineers freedom. Engineers were very loyal to their companies and uh, Japanese firms couldn't compete in lucrative defense contracts, so they focused on consumer electronics and they had to continually innovate to escape uh, cutthroat competition. Um, public research institutes in Japan, such as the Electrotechnical Laboratory, was very, very helpful for firms, too, in terms of uh, helping them to learn new technologies, helping them to choose appropriate technologies. So basically, as soon as the transistor was invented, the Electrotechnical Laboratory began researching this, began, they would go to the U.S. Armed Forces libraries, they would copy by hand articles on semiconductors, they would, I'm, I'm sorry, on transistors, they would take them home, study them. So uh, the, these government public research institutes were very helpful in helping firms to learn appropriate technologies. And then Japanese firms benefited from open markets in the United States, they exported millions and millions of radios, televisions, watches, calculators, other electronics goods. And so this led to huge efficiency gains and uh, uh, benefits from learning by doing. So let me go on to talk a little bit about um, Taiwan and, and uh, South Korea's experience. So what we see is that um, the Republic of China lost the war in 1949 to the People's Republic of China and evacuated to Taiwan. <clears throat> there was continual conflict between the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China. Um, at this point, uh, Taiwan was very, very poor its GDP per capita was below Haiti and Cuba's. Economic development was essential for um, survival. Um, and so what we saw was the Taiwanese government, based on advice from leading economists, decided to abandon an import substitution policy instead to focus on exports. And Taiwan also invested in education much more than other countries at their level of development. So in, in the 60s, for instance, Taiwan established uh, nine years mandatory education at a time when very few emerging economies had that. Um, in 1966, Tatung Company exported two million radios for Japanese uh, trading companies, Sogo Shosha. Uh, Taiwanese firms obtained technology and training from Japanese companies, and by 1973, Taiwan was the world's third leading exporter of televisions and a vibrant supplier of TVs and electronic parts and components. So at this point, Japanese corporations were actually helping the Taiwanese corporations to learn the technology. They provided them with training. The Taiwanese <coughs> workers were, were fairly well educated and were able to learn this new technology. Then in 1974, um, Taiwan faced a major crisis. So first of all, in the 1970s, 
uh, Taiwan faced quotas on textile exports uh, through the multi fiber agreement. So textiles was one of the leading things Taiwan was exporting. All of a sudden, they had to limit their exports. Taiwan had to leave the United Nations after the U.S. established relations with the People's Republic of China. Um, Taiwan and Japan severed relationships in 1972, so Taiwan lost access to vital Japanese capital goods and technology. Then during the first oil crisis in the 70s, Taiwan had a 47 percent increase in the consumer price index. So basically, Taiwan was in a crisis environment, and one of the things that they did is they, the government conferred very extensively with Chinese experts from the United States. So Chinese experts in the United States were very sympathetic with Taiwan. They were willing to help with, at no charge. So they, they, they didn't receive any money. They just were willing to give their advice for free. So for instance, Wen Yuan Pan, who was director at RCA's prestigious Sarnoff Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, told the Taiwanese government, you should focus on semiconductors. Given all the small and medium-sized companies in Taiwan, this would be a very good um, uh, uh, product for you to focus on. <clears throat> and so then Pan, and he also established a technical advisor committee of experts, Chinese researchers from the United States at leading firms, leading universities. And so what they recommended to, to the Taiwanese government is to assimilate 7.0 micron CMOS technology when the frontier technology was 3.0. So they were going to learn a, a mature technology. Um, and RCA then transferred the technology, trained the engineers. Many of these Taiwanese engineers had PhDs from US universities. They were very well trained. Um, and so then these engineers worked very hard to, uh, to learn this new technology. By 1979, they were producing yields which surpassed those at RCA. So then the Industrial Technology Research Institute, which was a publicly funded research institute, at this point spun off a private company, UMC, United Microelectronics Corporation. So <clears throat> UMC joined the, uh, a science park, which was established by the government. This science park was next to two universities, and its director had received 36 US patents. So UMC was now close to researchers. It received low interest loans, inexpensive land, tax holidays, from the science park. And so now today, UMC remains a leading semiconductor company. Um, then ITRI uh, focused on very large scale integration, which is putting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands um, of, of chips together. Um, and they spun off the company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. So ITRI transferred 150 employees to the new company rented its manufacturing plant to TSMC. TSMC's first chairman, Morris Chang, had been vice president of Texas Instruments, so he had a lot of knowledge, experiential knowledge, of the semiconductor industry. Um, and TSMC decided to make integrated circuits according to other firm specifications rather than designing them in-house. So this assures its customers that it's a partner rather than a competitor, and it's now <coughs> the world's most advanced semiconductor manufacturer. If we look at Korea, Korea was very similar to Taiwan. It was very poor in 1960, um, and it faced a constant threat of military uh, invasion from the north. Economic development was imperative for it to survive. Uh, President Chung Hee Park um, was very impressed with Japanese, Japan's export-oriented growth, and so he chose that as the model for Korea. And so the, the government took control of the banking system, provided loans at below market interest rates, and also rescinded credits if firms failed at exporting. So there was a very strong incentive for firms to export. So if these large Korean firms were not successful at exporting, they lost access to credit. And I think if you look 10 years later, maybe only three of the 10 firms originally getting credit continued to receive it. Korea also invested heavily in education, progressing from 25% of the average schooling years of the frontier country in 1960 to 75% in 2000. Um, in the 60s, it imported packaged technologies to produce consumer goods. Uh, Japanese corporations provided parts and components and training and know-how. But by 1975, Korea began to do its own um, uh, local innovation. Um, so it had uh, entrepreneurs, uh, a capable workforce, and so it didn't just assimilate technology, it didn't just copy technologies from abroad, but it did its own innovation. Um, so perhaps the most successful Jap Korean company is Samsung, 
So it originally had partnered with Japanese firms and obtained uh, know-how from them, and it combined this with low-cost labor to, um, to produce things like black and white TVs. Um, but Samsung also decided to try to make color TVs. And at this point, um, there were no market for color TVs in Korea, and, and foreign firms weren't willing to impart the technology. So uh, Samsung took apart foreign color TVs, learned how to make them. It just continued to work hard, and finally succeeded in making color televisions for export. So it was really responding to the government's incentive to export in things like this. And also, Samsung was, would look at what Sony had produced at the same, when it, when it was at the same level of development as Samsung was, and use that as guidance. So whatever uh, the progression Sony followed, Samsung followed that maybe 10 or 20 years later. Um, and then in 1980s, uh, the Samsung founder decided to focus on DRAM chips, which is a very difficult thing to produce. It's a very standardized commodity. Prices fall very quickly, very short product cycles. So he re recruited engineers from the United States, sent engineers to the US, and <clears throat> very soon they produced quality chips. And um, another thing which uh, uh, Byung-Chul Lee's son, who became chairman, did was he, he realized that Samsung was producing low quality consumer goods, and so he basically burned all of the consumer goods in the presence of Samsung employees. He demanded improvements, and the quality of Samsung cell phones and consumer electronics goods um, improved very rapidly. So how can, what do we learn from this experience? We see that Japanese firms were providing the know-how, the technology, and the training. So this is consistent with what Professor Kojima said, that FDI can also impart um, uh, skills and um, training. We saw that local engineers were, were well-educated, very adept at assimilating technologies, reverse engineering products such as color TVs, innovating. Um, we saw that uh, ITRA, the, the government um, uh, research institute, promoted semiconductors by uh, identifying and absorbing new technologies, training researchers, spinning off companies. Um, and this happened as Taiwan faced a major crisis. And so at this point, the government focused on development to survive. And researchers in political science have said that when national security concerns are paramount, the, the political uh, um, environment reacts as a unified actor. And at other times, interest group competition, rent seeking, and distributional struggles can predominate. Um, um, so the incentives of government officials at this time was to try to survive, try to help their country survive. Another problem is government officials might not have the requisite knowledge. But Taiwan solved that problem by accessing knowledge from overseas, the overseas Chinese diaspora. So you had many, many very educated, very successful uh, Chinese researchers and professors abroad, and they were very willing to provide help. So they, they pinpointed semiconductors as a profitable um, uh, product. They, they helped with the transferring knowledge. So, so this helped uh, guide Taiwan in the choices to make. Um, Korea promoted semiconductors, used a carrot and stick approach, um, and Korea faced a continual threat of invasion from the north. And Korean workers are very patriotic, determined for Korea to succeed economically. And so in these crisis environment for both Korea and Taiwan, the idea that um, the country is working together for survival seems like a good dis description. Um, let me go on, I'm running a little low on time. Um, if we look at um, ASEAN, what we saw in the late 80s was uh, Japan, um, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore experienced very large appreciations, which caused them to lose price competitiveness. So there was a large cost saving if they could transfer factories to lower wage uh, locations. The HDD um, um, industry moved to Thailand and a very, very intricate network developed where they were sourcing parts and components from local firms, from firms within, a, say, um, a three-hour radius. And they, the, the firms in the supply chain work very closely together. So say, for instance, if a Japanese company delivered a, a defective part to a, 
company in Thailand. They would send their engineers right away to figure out what went wrong, how they could solve it. The teams worked together, and there was upgrading within these value chains that occurred as um, foreign engineers trained Thai engineers and Thai engineers trained other Thai engineers. Um, so this was a very successful value chain. Um, on the other hand, Malaysia tried to upgrade its semiconductor industry, and it never really succeeded. So it saw how the Malaysian government saw how uh, Taiwan and South Korea had been very successful in integrated circuits, and so it established MIMOS as a, a public research institute to try to promote semiconductor firms, um, and they created um, the firm Silterra, but Silterra never really succeeded. So politics in Malaysia was dominated by trying to help local Malaysians as opposed to ethnic Chinese and Indian Malaysians. So when they were choosing leaders for the firms, they didn't cho choose the best candidate with tacit and experiential knowledge. So for instance, Malaysia could have hired Lok Kien Hua, who was the managing director of the German uh, company Kimoda, but they didn't. They were also reluctant to provide grants to ethnic Chinese firms, even though these were the most dynamic. Um, they didn't withhold benefits to firms that performed badly. The educational system didn't pr promote, produce enough high quality engineers and scientists because admissions were strongly influenced by the politics of ethni ethnicity. Um, so what we see is that um, Malaysia never really developed into a cutting edge um, IC producer. And so the government was focusing more on redistributing wealth. When firms are making decisions based on redistributive uh, questions rather than choosing the most qualified candidate, very often they, they fail. So Malaysia didn't succeed at develop, be, developing a cutting edge IC industry, whereas Taiwan and South Korea did. So then China, we know the experience of China very well. So China um, originally uh, uh, developed special economic zones, say in the Pearl River, Yangtze River, with superb networks of highways, ports, infrastructures. China then joined the WTO, which gave investors confidence it would follow the rule of law. At this point, the electronics industry in, in China just took off. So China was um, uh, very, very successful, say, at attracting FDI from Taiwan. Uh, so for instance, Taiwanese notebook, the notebook PC industry was established in the Yangtze River Delta, and you had very, very intricate clusters develop where productivity growth was just amazing. Um, also, if we look at China's exchange rates, um, so here's a graph where we see the, the renminbi exchange rate and then the exchange rate in upstream countries which provide parts and components, such as Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. We saw the renminbi appreciated very rapidly, but exchange rates in upstream countries did not. So the, the products that China was exporting remained very price competitive, largely because the semiconductors, the image sensors, the other inputs from upstream Asian countries um, uh, were, were produced in countries with, with weak exchange rates, which kept the products competitive. Um, so policymakers oftentimes said the renminbi has to appreciate, but what happened is that appreciated a lot, but upstream exchange rates, say in Taiwan and Korea, didn't, and so the, the products remained very, very competitive. Um, Okay, let me just quickly uh, talk about lessons for the United States from the experience of Asia. So one lesson, we saw that Taiwan, Korea, other East Asian countries invested in education and learning, and educated and competent workers are much better able to absorb new technologies. So in the, the, the PISA test, which is the OECD test of 15-year-olds, uh, their, uh, their, what they've learned, um, what we saw is that China ranked first, Singapore ranked second, Macau ranked third, Hong Kong fourth, Japan sixth, Korea seventh, Taiwan eighth, and the U.S. 25th. So it seems like the U.S. educational system is, is failing compared to the Asian educational systems. And so the U.S. should start investing in education beginning and in human capital beginning at a very early age. Um, in this digital economy, education should impart advanced cognitive skills such as complex problem solving, social skills such as teamwork, adaptive skills such as reasoning and self-efficacy. Um, and the U.S. should also seek to recruit engineers and scientists who have tacit experience from Asia. A second thing we see is that semiconductor manufacturing requires huge and continuous investment. 
And Asian countries, when electronics moved to Asia, had very high national savings rates, which provided funds for capital formation. What we see is that the U.S. runs very large budget deficits year after year during good times, bad times. This reduces national savings and siphons off funds that could go to private investment. It also contributes to large U.S. trade deficits. So it, to strengthen its manufacturing sector, its semiconductor sector, the U.S. should reduce its budget deficit. Here's a graph of the U.S. budget deficit, and it's just year after year, it's just enormous. Um, the same is true for the U.S. trade deficit over the last um, 40 years. A second thing which we learned from Asia is that um, incentives were very important. So Asian entrepreneurs were not guaranteed success. They had to compete actively in markets in order to succeed. And even though U.S. researchers invented many of the, the new technologies in electronics, it was usually Asian firms rather than U.S. firms that profited. So Asian firms had to compete in demanding consumer markets, whereas U.S. electronics firms were coddled by very lucrative defense contracts. And so Huffbrauer and Jung uh, uh, emphasized that competition is actually very necessary for U.S. firms to succeed. Um, another thing is to encourage entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurs were vital in Asia's success. So Akio, Morita, at Sony, Tadashi, Sasaki, at Sharp, Bung Cho Lee at Samsung. And so when the U.S. is seeking to promote the semiconductor industry, it should give pride of place to entrepreneurs, and they should be allowed to take risks and to fail. So for instance, the CEO of Intel received $180 million in salary in 2021, even as his company stock was doing very badly. So you want entrepreneurs to have the uh, appropriate incentives, to have incentives to pass market tests, instead of just to lobby the government for more um, uh, largesse. Um, also, Asia created a very positive research environment when it was most successful. So researchers at Seiko and Sharp had a lot of freedom to do research. And a lot of time, innovative breakthroughs come not when people are demanding it of you in a militaristic manner, but when researchers are free to actually um, come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things. Um, and finally, what we see in the United States is that lobbying and rent seeking are endemic. They're just, just everywhere. And so in this environment, like in Malaysia, industrial po policy is likely to fail. Um, also, <clears throat> um, in addition to cutting the budget deficit, which economists call expenditure reducing policies, expenditure switching policies can be helpful. And tariffs are one example, but they're very, very problematic. Um, but uh, the exchange rate would, might be a better tool. So right now what we see is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, other Asian supply chain countries have very, very weak ex exchange rates. Maybe they're too weak. And if so, this is going to make it very hard for the U.S. to compete. So if there's some way that exchange rates could adjust, that would be helpful. And finally, we see in Asia, industrial clusters were very, very beneficial. So when the U.S. is trying to build a semiconductor sector, it needs not only the semiconductor manufacturing, but also other companies to provide the capital goods, the parts, the chemicals. So you want to uh, try to develop industrial clusters in the United States also. Thank you very much.